Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Annabelle Haudegui, and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Department of Multicultural Affairs. Our moderator today is Dr. Gordon Bronitsky, founder and president of Bronitsky and Associates and Indigenow, which has worked with indigenous peoples around the world in the performing arts and festival, since the festival development since 1994. We thank him for curating the speaker series. I will let him take it away so he can formally introduce our presenter today in celebration of Native American Heritage Month, Virginia Ballinger. Just a reminder that you are encouraged to participate and ask questions via chat. At the end of the presentation, a quick survey will pop up regarding today's presentation, and we would really appreciate it if you could take two minutes of your time to fill it out for us. Gordon, feel free to take it away. All right. Thank you very much. I want to express my appreciation first to the Department of Multi Multicultural Affairs at Eastern New Mexico University for this speaker series, as, which is a celebration of Native American heritage. And it's really a pleasure to introduce Virginia Ballinger. She's one of the leading designers. She's been in this business, I think, at least 30 years. She's won almost, she's won every award that I've ever heard of. And if I could use a personal note, I organized a one woman show for her in Moscow under the auspices of the US Embassy when I found out she's not only a great designer, she's a great pleasure to work with. And with that, let me give you Virginia Ballinger. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. To start off the program, I will introduce myself in Navajo. Nothing George do shut the art then I de a yanasha. Nothing George get gallop New Mexico, get a ya, non nishbeish what a tatin do as tana, non nishbeish what could never hold spirit for ya, a ya, and the eight cut go because ah, a call a hiha. Thank you again for being with us this afternoon. Today I will share with you the history of Navajo fashion from my knowledge and the history of my business as Navajo Spirit. Okay. Uh. Throughout history, Navajo women have been resourceful, resilient, and innovative. They are designers and to prove what great designers Navajo women are throughout history and to this day, you can just look around at the fashion trends that have continued for many years where people, major fashion companies, draw inspiration from the beauty of Navajo culture. Back before we had access to, to cloth, to cotton, to velvet, Navajo women wove yucca fibers and wore leather. When I was studying fashion, I was at the museum in Chicago and there was a leather dress that was on display and it was attributed to Navajo wear from the 1400s. The leather that was available to my people back in the 1400s and earlier would have been deerskin, antelope, and buffalo. And the dress that I saw that was in the museum what had fringe on it, not as long as what is in the photo here, but this dress was created for a fashion show that we used to do in Gallup for many, for four years, we did an annual fashion show called A Journey in Navajo Fashion. And at the beginning of the show, we did a, a timeline and this, was, this dress was created for that show. When the Navajo women picked up weaving, they, wo they wove blankets for the men to wear and two rectangular pieces of rug were woven and they were stitched at the shoulders and down the side seam if 
the family had access to silver, then the husband usually hammered some silver pins to wear on the shoulder and on the side. <clears throat> At the shoulder, when women were either nursing, then it was just pinned on the shoulder and it could be let down to, to nurse the baby. And the, the middle of the dress was tied with a uh, hand-woven sash belt. In the 1600s, when the Pueblo revolt was going on, the, there were Pueblos, Pueblo people that took refuge with the Navajo people. And one, one theory is that's how Navajo women picked up the weaving was through the Pueblos that took refuge with our tribe. The other theory is more of a traditional base belief and that is that the Navajo women learned how to weave from Spider Woman. The dress on the right is my modern adaptation of the hand woven rug dress. The dress on the right is made from ultra suede and appliqued with geometric designs. When this dress was first created, the belt had, a, had fringes and the fringes had animal fetishes sewn onto it. And through the years, I've lost track of the, the fetish belt. When Navajo women, the dress, the rug dress that I showed in the previous photo, that's what the women were wearing when we were put into captivity at Fort Sumner, Wilde. And while the women were, while the tribe, the tribal members were at Fort Sumner, they were issued fabric, muslin, calico, and the women would wear them similar design to the rug dresses with the rectangular, uh, with a hole cut in the middle for the head. And upon return to our our homelands, trading posts cropped up on the reservation. And with the advent of the railroad through, the, through this part of the country, we now had access to cloth. And the women loved the cotton velveteen. It was heavy, it was durable, and it was a magnificent backdrop for the silver work that their husbands were doing. This blouse is an antique velvet blouse that was gifted to me. There was a, an Anglo woman that lived in this area. She was married to a Navajo medicine man. And when they parted ways, she came to see me in my shop one day. And she said, Virginia, I am moving from this area. And I have a collection of beautiful velvet blouses that I have had. And she said, I don't want to take them with me. She said, I believe these blouses need to stay with the Navajo people. And I don't know anybody else that would treasure them and take care of them the way I know you would. So she gifted me about four or five blouses that were loaded with silver. And this particular red shirt, I would guess was probably made in the 1940s from the way the construction is. The center front just has a tear down the middle and then the placket folds over and pins on with safety pins. And you will see antique blouses that are decorated with silver buttons. They could either be strung on a string and then tacked along onto the garment so that way it could be easily removed and moved to another garment if it needed to be, or they were individually sewn on. The blouses pictured in this frame, these were in a museum collection in Santa Fe that I went in and studied. They had a, a large collection of antique blouses and a lot of the old Navajo blouses were also decorated with rickrack and silver buttons. 
And what I found interesting about this blouse was that it was fully lined with cotton. And the, the woman that owned this blouse made herself a little armpit vent, which I had never seen before, but the armpit was open to allow for, for ventilation. And you'll see a lot of antique blouses also decorated with coins. The 1940s Mercury dimes, those were a favorite. They would be domed and then a loop would be soldered on the back and they would be used to adorn women's blouses. The rust colored shirt has a lot of butterfly pins. And after the velveteen, after the cotton velveteen was hard to find, around the 1950s, the 1960s, people were becoming a little more modern. And I believe the full skirt, that style was adapted from the Spanish women in this area because after our tribe came back from Fort Sumner and we had sheep, the women were weaving and the weaving, the weaving changed from weaving garments to wear to more of a commercial aspect to it where the traders were, the women were trading their rugs for coffee, sugar, flour, from the trading posts and they would sell rugs that were made for sale to eastern to people on the east on the east coast and around the 50s women just embraced all this rickrack they loved sewing rows and rows of rickrack and the term broomstick skirt comes from taking a skirt and wetting it and pulling it over a broom handle and then wrapping it with string with cloth strips to cause the pleating. That's where the term broomstick skirt comes from. These are made from cotton muslin and from a heavier gauze, a crinkle cotton. And these, these dresses I found in antique shops. And now we come to a period of time where rayon velvet was readily available through stores from the 1970s through the 1990s. You could go into any trading post. You could go into a store down tall, downtown Gallup called Zimmerman's and they had plenty of rayon velvet it had a beautiful soft hand to it and came in a multitude of colors. When I first started my fashion business in 1984, we had access to, to velvet. It would get shipped to us from Blackstone, Virginia. There was a mill here in the country that produced rayon velvet. And around the beginning of 2000, the company filed for bankruptcy and closed up shop. And after that, any of the velvets that we work with had to be imported from either Korea or Japan or China. And this dress on the left was designed and sewn in 2000 when the Saka Juia dollar coin was first minted. My husband took 30 of the coins and domed them for me and made flutes on the back and decorated this dress. And instead of the pin tucks being vertical as is traditional, I decided to do them on a diagonal. And the weight of the, the blouse is very heavy. You definitely can feel the weight of the $30 on your, sh 
on your blouse. The photo on the right is of me when we did the fashion show that Gordon referred to earlier. This is also a, another form of velvet. This velvet has is, it mimics the antique cotton velveteen and it has a, a flat nap to it and it has a shimmer to it. This blouse I designed in August of 2020 when Santa Fe Indian Market was canceled due to the virus and we had to do Santa Fe Indian Market on online. So I knew of a customer that was looking for a, an outfit for her daughter. And I designed this with her in mind. And the blouse is decorated with hand stamped sterling silver buttons and fluted buttons. And I did a, a deep V hem on the blouse. And the, the stitching detail this is not pin tucking. Pin tucking is where you fold the garment and you stitch close to the edge of the fold. That produces a pin tuck. And the pin tuck derived from the period of time when Navajo women did not have access to scissors. So they would take a piece of the cotton velveteen, measure it across their back, measure it across their arm, and tear it into rectangles. And then the pin tucking was used to take out the fullness in the chest area and on the sleeve. That's where those uh, design details originate from. And in this blouse, I, we used double needles to sew stitches that accented the blouse without actually forming a tight pin tuck. And the skirt is made from crushed satin with an inset of the shimmer velvet with the double stitching on it also. We made this outfit, took photos of it, sent it to the customer in mine, and that was exactly what she needed. This photo is from Santa Fe Indian Market from 2019. I have been participating in Santa Fe Indian Market since the early 1980s. When I first, when I first got married and moved to Topeka, Kansas with my husband, we both worked for the railroad. And in the evenings, I would sew for pleasure and designed garments. Being in Topeka, I missed being around all the Navajo people in Gallup. So my way of getting to be around other native people was to run off to Indian art shows. But I needed a good reason to go to an art show and that was to, to sell my, my garments. So I would sew and design during the week. And when there was an art show, they, they had art shows in San Ildefonso, in Denver, and just various places throughout the country. I would sew a few things during the, the weekday and then on weekends, sometimes I would go set up a booth and interact with people and be around other Native American people and listen to powwow music and just kind of get re-energized. So that's kind of how the business started was I had six dresses that I had designed. I would go to art shows and I would hang up my samples in my booth and interact with the customers, take their measurements and go home and custom make dresses to fit the various sizes and send them out. And one of my most favorite shows to do was Santa Fe Indian Market. And on Sunday morning, they have a clothing contest where everybody participates, young kids, men, women, teenagers, modern designers, this dress, the black velvet evening gown that is being modeled by my daughter, Courtney. We entered that at the clothing contest in the designer section and won best of show in the contemporary division in 2019. The name of the design is the slender one. 
It is an evening gown that is inspired by the constellation Orion. The front of the dress is accented with Royston turquoise and hand stamped fluted sterling silver buttons. The black velvet represents the night sky and the crystal beads on the bottom of the dress and the train represents the stars in the sky. And the constellation of Orion is depicted in turquoise stones on the train of the dress. This design won best in category and best in division at the, San, at the Gallup Intertribal Indian Ceremonial and also the People's Choice Award and then the best of show at Santa Fe in the modern clothing division. This dress is a dress that we made for Anawa Lacey, Miss New Mexico USA in 2006. I took a different take on the back of the dress and instead of just doing a straight design, we incorporated a stair step design and accented it with sterling silver buttons. Navajo elegance is displayed in this photo. This dress was also designed for a juried art competition at Santa Fe Indian Market. The photo is a little bit blurry, but the strap of the dress is a sterling silver strap with turquoise stones in it. And across the chest, it is encrusted with turquoise nuggets that were individually sewn on. And the, the slit on the skirt is also has a cluster of turquoise stones. And she has a scarf that I designed across her shoulder. Here, traditional alongside modern. When I first moved to Topeka, I was working in an office in the freight claims department for Santa Fe Railway Company. And I wanted to wear clothing that had a native flair to it. So I would sew dresses that I would wear to the office, but I would do applique on it and do stair step designs. I would incorporate silver buttons instead of plastic buttons. I used to participate in a show in Scottsdale, Arizona that was run by Don Owen. Don Owen ran the Santa Fe Indian Market for many years and did an amazing job. He started another show in Scottsdale in the, in the early 1990s and he was doing a fundraiser. He was raising money for a cause and I designed the, the dress on the right, the traditional looking dress that has Kennedy half dollars as pins down the front and the Kennedy half dollars are encircled with turquoise stones and the large buttons on this blouse were quarters that were domed and had loops on the back to be sewn on to the blouse. And that was a donation to the fundraising effort that Don Owen did. And that's me in my purple crushed velvet suit. In 2006, our niece came to us and she said, I want a close fitting dress made for me. She was graduating from college, was getting ready to embark on the path of being a school teacher. And she wanted a dress made out of a Pendleton blanket, form fitting. And I remember thinking, a dress out of a blanket? It sounds real heavy and uncomfortable, but she started a trend that has been going and going and going ever since. So we make a ton of blanket dresses every year during graduation season, all the way from Head Start promotions to eighth grade promotions to high school graduates and college graduates. They come in, we have a photo album in the store that the 
the young ladies look through, they decide which dress style they want. And then they look through the Pendleton catalog and pick out which blanket they want. And then we measure them and custom make them. And they have to be form fitting so that it can accent their flattering waistlines. And graduation is a big deal for Navajo people in the area. I think because there are grandmas and maybe even parents that never made it to being a college graduate. So when a family has a high school and a college graduate, it, it is cause for a big celebration. So it always warms my heart when I see grandma coming in and helping her granddaughter select the blanket to get the dress made out of. And I think another reason why we do so many blanket dresses is because we do not have that many weavers available any longer to weave blankets to make the traditional rug dresses. So we started giving away a dress every year and the promotion is called Graduate in Style. When the young ladies come in and order their dress from us, we put their name in a basket. And at the end of graduation season, we draw a name from that basket. And whoever, whoever's name gets drawn, we give the money back to the family. And that is our way of giving back during the season when we get a lot of business. And we, we definitely appreciate all of our customers and try really hard to, to take care of our customers and make sure that the garment fits just right. And a lot of them send us photos after their photo shoot to share their beautiful photos with us. The blanket on the left is the Navajo water blanket. At Navajo Spirit, we also make blanket coats. Again, we have our customers come in and pick out which blanket they want their coat made out of. And our coats are reversible. They have a big patch pocket on the front. And then on the inside, there is a slash pocket and the conchos are snaps. And we also make little bolero jackets. Several years ago, for many years, I had been wanting to start a scarf line and eventually, finally the time came and I wanted a scarf that displayed designs from various rugs and in the turquoise and purple, that, des that design is derived from the two gray hills rug pattern. The middle scarf is a Navajo basket and it's a purse scarf where you just tie it on the strap of your purse. And if you're ever in a room where it's kind of chilly, you just take the scarf off and put it around your neck to, to warm yourself. And the scarf on the right, that is our Navajo jewel scarf. Navajo Arts and Crafts, which is an enterprise of the Navajo Nation, celebrated their 75th anniversary a few years back and they put out a call to Navajo artists to submit designs to help them celebrate their 75th anniversary. And the, the jewelry collection that is displayed on the scarf is from my personal collection. The concho belt that is displayed there was a gift from my mother around 1976. I graduated high school in 1975. And in 1976, I got the bright idea that I was going to join the Marines. And my mother thought that was a very, very bad life decision. And she came to me one day and she gifted this belt to me. And she said, please do not join the Marines. So I always remember that. And of course, I have outgrown that belt, but my daughter now fits into it. And the basket in the, in the scarf, that is 
the basket that had that held our Navajo um, blue corn mush when we got married. The pins, the butterfly pins, the four butterfly pins that are encircling the turquoise cluster pin, those are off of a mother-daughter set that I designed many years ago and that won numerous ribbons. And on the front of the scarf, you don't see it, but there is a photo of a, a rug that our daughter Courtney wove. And then there is a little sash belt and that is from uh, a little queen sash that one of our daughters won in a Navajo princess pageant. So this scarf is very personal and treasured. There are needlepoint uh, bracelets also on the scarf and those are from bracelets that I wore when I was Miss Indian, New Mexico. The Navajo Cinderella gown on the left is from the I incorporated the two gray hill scarf in black and gray and the top of the gown is black velvet. And we wanted to do, we get a lot of requests from our customers for prom dresses, for wedding dresses. And again, this design was also created for a juried art competition. The photo on the right is my daughter, Amber, and this is from the fashion show at the Heard Museum Indian Fair in Phoenix, Arizona. This is in 2019, and Amber is modeling a little dress. The top is lined around the neck and the arm edge with turquoise stones, and the fabric is some fabric that I designed and had printed for me, showing a turquoise cluster design. The rust colored crushed velvet top is a handkerchief hem top, can be worn with jeans and has ribbons, turquoise and rust colored ribbons hanging off the edge. So that is my, my ribbon handkerchief top. This beautiful black velvet evening gown was designed for our daughter, Anna, when she competed for the Miss Gallup Intertribal Indian Ceremonial Queen, which was a title that I held in 1984, I believe. No, 1980. And then Anna, our oldest daughter, also held that same title. The black velvet dress has a drape across the front that gathers up onto that satin um, strip on the side. And that is accented with sand cast pins with a turquoise stone in the middle and the silver around the neckline is again hand stamped sterling silver buttons that my husband makes for me. These two beautiful women are Russian models. This is from our Moscow fashion show in 2004. On our travels to Moscow, we traveled with Gordon and we took a choreographer with us and I took a personal assistant and we missed our connection in Paris. I remember we missed our flight out and some people were upset, but I wasn't. I thought, well, let's go downtown. Let's go downtown Paris and have lunch on a sidewalk cafe. And that's exactly what we did. And it all worked out. But I took 10 duffel bags of clothing to Moscow, which Gordon, very happily helped cart around from here to there. And I took some moccasins, I took hair ties, and the model on the left, I had put her hair up in a Navajo bun. And this blue blouse is decorated with the domed mercury dimes that I was talking about earlier and turquoise cluster pins. And the model on the right is wearing our Canyon de Shea dress. This photo is from Yakutsk, Russia, which is in Siberia. We traveled there in 2016. Again, this was coordinated for us by Gordon. And there were a group of us 
Navajo people, Dr. Elmer Guy from Navajo Technical University in Crown Point, and Edison Itsui, his wife Ruth Itsui, and um, young lady from Ganado, a school teacher. We all went, it was a cultural exchange visit and I took Navajo clothing and participated in a exquisite fashion show. We were treated like royalty and I found during the visit that they or their customs are somewhat similar to Navajo people. We were, we met with a, one of their spiritual leaders who had a drum and which was similar to the Plains Indians drums. And he did a blessing for us there. They regard horses very highly. We had an opportunity to eat horse meat and we were, we were treated very well. It was a very rewarding trip. These models, these are also from the Moscow, from the Yakutsk fashion show, excuse me. The model on the left is modeling a wedding dress. I used the Hacienda Pendleton blanket for the bodice of the bridal gown. And the bottom of the bridal gown is ivory crushed velvet. And the bridal bouquet is done in a Navajo wedding basket. The model on the right is wearing a Navajo water coat with a matching tote bag. For a while, I was designing wedding dresses until that became a little bit too stressful. But this is a wedding dress that I designed and there is lace, rayon velvet, and hand stamped sterling silver buttons on this gown. And this photo is taken, was taken in front of our Santa Fe Indian Market booth in 2019. These are my daughters. Standing next to me is our oldest daughter, Anna, and then Courtney and Amber. And the young lady in the tall banner that says Navajo Spirit, she is Danielle that used to work in my, my store. And she has a one of the Pendleton Montas in Black Chief Joseph with a ginormous turquoise cluster pin up on her shoulder. Back when I first started doing art shows and traveling. We used to travel to art shows once a month. That was how we got our name out and met customers and got customer feedback on the designs that I was doing. That was back in the early 1980s. And these days we do four shows a year. And in March, we travel to Phoenix to participate in the Herd Museum Indian Fair. In August, we do Santa Fe Indian Market, which is the granddaddy of them all. And in November, we go to Los Angeles and exhibit at the Jean Autry Museum. December, we travel to Washington, DC, and we do the winter market at the National Museum of the American Indian. And we have a store located in Gallup, New Mexico, located at 815 West Cole Avenue. If you are ever in the area, please stop in, visit our store, come in and say yate, take a look around, buy a gift, take something special home to your loved ones. And we also, I also have some of my designs and scarves on my Artspan website. And that is on the screen right now, vballinger.artspan.com. That is where we did our selling this year because we could not be at Santa Fe Indian Market. So that is the end of my presentation. And I thank you again for being with us this afternoon. <laughs> and thank you. There are some questions in the chat room that I'd like to share with you. 
Um, Diana Cordova says, how long does it take you to create a traditional velvet dress? The, the traditional velvet blouses, they all have to be cut by hand because they're custom cut to the customer's measurements. So that can take anywhere from two to three days. If the skirt has to be pleated, we have a metal framework that has a bunch of slats that hang down and the, the skirt is put on that metal framework and is allowed to dry overnight. So when I do a design for a juried art competition, a lot of times that can take anywhere from two to three weeks. And when I go to work on doing a juried art piece, if I make a mistake and that mistake becomes part of the design because when you're doing something and it doesn't quite work out, then you improvise and you change it around. And that's how the, the art piece develops. That's how the dress takes its own form. You may have a certain design in mind as to how it's going to turn out, but the fabric also has its own idea on what it wants to become. So you just work with it. And in the end, the mistake becomes part of the garment and it's not a mistake. It's just working with the fabric. It works itself out with you. Okay. Another question from Diana Cordova. How do you get your inspiration? I get my inspiration from, I will, I have a collection of books. I look at old photographs of Native American people. I also will look through Pinterest. And I also look at Navajo women in the area. What are they wearing? How are they wearing it? And that's how I, I do sketches. I, I do sketches and I pin fabric on my mannequin and I place buttons on it. I place turquoise stones on it. I place ribbons on it and start working at it. And sometimes, like I said earlier, what I had planned, you know, it, it turns out different, but I'm always, I'm always pleased with what, what's created. Okay, from Annabelle Haragui, how far in advance does someone have to place an order usually? Three weeks. Three weeks on the blanket dresses, two weeks on a coat. And I used to do wedding dresses, but those are too stressful. So I kind of shy away from doing wedding dresses anymore, just because it's such a special event for the bride and brides can be very emotional. <laughs> oh, I spare myself. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Uh, Diana Cordova says, your, your, your model daughters are beautiful. Are you teaching your daughters the artistry of sewing? They know how to, to sew basically, but they have, I think they have seen the, the backside of the business. We used to cart them all, all around the country when we, were, when we were first traveling to art shows. They see the work and the, the stress and the hours that it takes to maintain our business. And they each, they all have their own different paths that they're traveling and it is not expected of them to do what mom does. This is what mom does. And this is what mom does that dad supports. But our oldest daughter is in marketing. She does marketing for hospitals. And our second oldest is in high-end retail, selling um, LV bags and get ready to move to Dallas to take on another position. And our youngest daughter, Amber, she's a lover of the outdoors and she she has a connection with children, so she's a teacher. And, you know, they can hem a pair of pants and take in a garment to fit them right, and that's about it. And I don't expect them to, to <laughs> carry on the business. 
Okay, Diana Cordovals would like to know, what are you working on presently? I am working on I am working on the the rickrack dresses that I showed earlier that the women that was all the rage in the 1950s. I want to do that for children. Mm -hmm. And with our store in Gallup, I would like to get away from doing custom orders and just stock the store with inventory. And I want to do a, a children's line where there are more, more designs right now. The basic velvet pullover shirt with the satin skirt, that's about the extent of the, the outfits that we do for little kids. But I want to do more of an expanded um, children's line. And I also want to do um, a new line of women's wear for the larger woman. Okay, and a question from Jose Sandoval. What do you think of the mixture between Western American cowboy fashion and Navajo fashion? I love it. Cowboys and Indians, I love it. It's beautiful. Okay. Well, a question for me then, because I'm interested. What kind of trends do you see now in native fashion? And I'm in particular interested because you're one of the designers, one of the few designers whose market is largely native. Most of your customers, I think, are Navajo or native. So what kind of, what kind of trends are you seeing now that are, that are changing and are new? Native fashion. You know, when, we, when I first got into the native fashion business in the early 1980s, there were about five of us throughout the country that did it as a business, not as a hobby. But now there are many, many designers. There are some great designers out there. The younger people have embraced it and it's exciting. You know, I'm, I look forward to the day when I can be standing in a checkout line at the grocery store and we see native models on the covers of the glossy magazines wearing native inspired fashion made by now native designers. So I think the trend is the young people, you know, they're, they're excited, they understand how to design garments using Illustrator and these computer programs. You know, I'm still, I'm old school. I still sketch out my designs with pencil and colored pencils to, to get my designs formulated. But I see some of these young designers hold, you know, um, growing their own companies and having their own corners in the department stores. And I, I see this just as the beginning of something really big that will, that will only continue to grow. And the outside world really sees the beauty. And then you have these other people kind of trotting alongside the authentic designers and, you know, gleaning what they can and running with it and mass producing something in China mm -hmm. and trying to sell it at half the cost or one fourth the cost of what it takes and the designer that, you know, puts a lot more effort into it and that is more authentic. So I think we're, we're at the beginning of something really big and wonderful. Okay. Uh, another question. Of all the countries you have visited in order to attend fashion shows, which one is your favorite? Well, I thought that when we went to South Africa, we traveled, there were a group of designers. This was coordinated through Santa Fe Indian market folk. The, we went to Johannesburg, Cape Town, and the country was beautiful. The culture was beautiful. The people there were, were, were beautiful. And 
I don't, I don't know. You know, every, every part of the world that I have visited, it's just the beauty of the people that live there. And people ask me, you know, what, what is different? How was it? And I said, they're just like us. They want a safe world for their children and for their grandchildren to grow up. And I treasure all these times that, that I have been able to go out of the country and to share the beautiful fashions that Navajo people wear and to share our culture with them. So I love everyone and I love every part of the world that I have been to. I really don't have a favorite. I just embrace it all. Well, that's good to hear. To what extent do you think Santa Fe Indian Market has helped Native designers break out of, you know, the Native market and into the larger market? Has it has it had a major role? It sure has. Santa Fe Indian Market is a great supporter for Indian designers. In years past, we used to do a fashion show on Saturday afternoon, on Saturday afternoon at the Museum of Natural History. And that's the name of that museum where we used to use the auditorium. And then now they do the haute couture on Sunday afternoon. And that's where people can just, you know, produce their, their wildest dreams. And I really enjoy seeing the, the uniqueness and the, you know, going way out on the edge with some of the designs that, that they show at the Oak Couture Show. Okay, I think I don't see any more questions. So let me take this opportunity to say what a great pleasure it has been, as always, to listen to you and to see your designs. And I thank you. And I know that Eastern New Mexico thanks you as well. It was a wonderful show. Thank you for having me. Gordon, thank you for helping us get this together in Virginia. What a beautiful presentation that was and so informative. And I think everybody that listened to it was just really taken back by your beautiful designs. Um, and also again, thank you everybody for participating in Native American Heritage Month. Be on the lookout for Black History Month events happening next semester. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Okay, thank you everyone so much. Bye. Till the next time. And uh, please don't forget to fill out the survey at the end once you exit the webinar. <laughs> Thank you so much. One last question. Do you think it's okay for me to go to the next Oh.